Yeah, uh, thanks, Steve. Um, as you said, I'm speaking about joint work with a constant fraction of the audience and constant fraction of the organizers, even. Um, and it is essentially uh, exact solver for linear programs using approximate solvers. Um, just to set the stage, we look at linear programs in the following standard form. So we have equality form for A, we have more columns than rows. Um, and I think the rest of the slide is uh, not necessary for the audience. So let me jump right ahead to fast weekly polynomial solvers. There has been lots of progress in the last 10 years in all kinds of settings uh, in different matrices. So what do I want from an approximate solver? You have some epsilon input and what you want is approximately feasible and an approximately optimal solution. Um, and the lower half of the slide, we see the, the yeah, essentially nearly optimal progress that has been made in recent years. Um, and that Jan presented yesterday, the main ideas behind most of them. Um, and for us, what's interesting is to turn these actually into exact solvers. And I have two kind of the general frameworks in which we are doing this. One is a black box approach, where you actually just need the epsilon approximation and nothing else of your solver. And the second uh, regime is essentially we open the black box and use different interior point methods to solve the piece exactly. Okay, so for the first approach, uh, as many of the audience will know, this is, has been done by Eva Tarosh in the mid 80s. And we uh, extend revisit the framework and use proximity results that I will show later to turn these approximate solvers into exact solvers. In the second setting, we have a different interior point method that was pioneered by Vavas and Ye in the mid 90s. And we augment their framework to have faster, um, more robust in the sense uh, interior point methods. Okay. Um, of course, we are not solving LPs exactly um, in time that is not dependent on a different condition number than what the approximate solvers do in some sort of uh, a bit complexity. So what we use is a different condition number that has been studied since the 60s by Deakin and Todd, and that is defined as some sort of reweighted projection. Um, and you can look at your, your favorite um, definition. Maybe convenient is the second property here to see it as kind of bring your matrix into, into basis form, then look at the norm of this, of this matrix, right? A convenient definition for our purposes would be the lifting cost definition that is displayed here, uh, which will be relevant for, for the interior point methods that, we, that I'm going to show later. Okay. Um, furthermore, I introduce a different condition number, which is more natural in the setting of proximity arguments for IP, and that is what we call the circuit imbalance measure. Um, and it's closely related to the chi bars that we just saw. And it's essentially uh, exactly what you would expect of, of a circuit to be. In matrioid land, you look at minimal dependent subsets of your elements in your kernel of your matrix, and you look at the ratios of non-zeros, okay? And now you maximize that between all pairs of elements and that you call your imbalance measure between circuits. Now clearly, for example, TU matrices have that this kappa is one. In general, kappa is at most big delta, where big delta is the maximum subdeterminant of your matrix. And this was the condition number for which Tadosh had this black box framework. And also what we showed is that if you apply the logarithm, then essentially kappa and kappa are the same. Okay. One thing I want to mention is the difference between the circuit and balance measure and, and this big delta. So as we've see, seen on the last slide, kappa is in general at most delta, but it can be much, much smaller, meaning exponentially smaller. And also this, I think is quite good to get a feeling about this kappa, what it is doing. So just imagine an incidence matrix of an undirected graph. And let's say the graph is complete. So you have order n many disjoint triangles. And then what you have is the maximum subdeterminant is going to be two to the order n, just because triangles uh, in general, odd cycles have subdeterminant two. So you get this, but what is kappa? So you have to think, okay, what are kind of support minimal elements in the kernel of an incidence matrix? And you can either have an, odd, an even cycle where you alternatingly do one minus one. So the imbalance is one, or you can have two odd cycles that are joined by a path and then you have to apply a two in the middle and you can think of it that this is all that can happen. So you have circuit imbalance measure two, which is clearly exponentially much smaller. So if you can turn Tardos framework from Delta into Kappa, then you can 
expect um, a factor n improvement. So the dependence is logarithmic in the condition number for both, and that is um, the, therefore you get this factor n improvement. Um, so now that we have a good intuition about the condition numbers, let me actually state the the results that I want to present in both in both regimes. So in the black box regime, it's essentially what I just said. So uh, from Tardis framework, in, in terms of delta, we go to kappa, and on the interior point method side, we augment the framework by Vasus and Yi, um, show that we need order n less iterations, and we use a scaling invariant version uh, whose relevance uh, will, will become clear later in my talk. Okay. Any questions this far on the condition numbers? If not, I would now go directly into the black box solvers. Okay. So for the black box approach, um, the main tool that we have is or are um, proximity arguments. And these are better stated if you think about subspaces instead of matrices. So let me just rewrite my system in the following sense. You see that on the primal side here, the movement that X is allowed to do is essentially the kernel of your matrix A. So you can just write, rewrite your system such that um, you optimize over um, movement in some subspace plus some affine shift. And same thing for the dual. And I will use from now on essentially both definitions. Uh, um, essentially um, at the same time. Okay. Um, now, what is our central proximity theorem that gives you, that allows you to turn an approximate solver to an exact solver? It is that if you have a feasible primal system, then whatever D has a negative components, there is a feasible solution that is only proportionately to your condition number away from your, from your initial vector D, okay? particular, if D is feasible, this is a trivial statement, then you pick X to be D. But in general, it tells you that if you have a vector that has small negativity, then there's a feasible solution that is not too far away. And what is the proof idea behind that? You just decompose, you just pick any, any element in, your, in the right subspace, you decompose the difference to the vector D, and you can decompose it into circuits. And you know that the circuit imbalance is bounded by your condition number kappa. So what you can do is, okay, Let's look at this picture. We have X in orange, blue in blue, we have D. D has a few negative components. You can decompose the difference into these three circuits and you know that they are not too imbalanced. And the idea is that you only have to apply to your negative vector D, these th circuits that intersect the negative components of D. So essentially all the shift shift you have to do is kind of, you have to fix the negative coordinates of these variables and get the delta of kappa times the negativity of D that gives you the proximity. Yes, you have to, yes. So indeed you cannot pick any decomposition. You would like to take a, a decomposition that is conformal or sound consistent um, and then this argument works out. Okay. And this as a central tool gives you Okay, this can also be done for optimization. So the first system here is again, the same, the, the same as on the last slide, feasibility. And for optimization, you have a similar argument that if you have a dual feasible vector or say that C is non negative, then you can find an optimal solution. That is again, the negativity of D away from, uh, from the current vector. And you also have to pay this time for whatever D has on the support of C. Okay, now this existence result doesn't give you anything yet. You, it's yet unclear how you would implement such a thing. And it's also unclear how you can find vectors D and C such that this right-hand side is small so that you can actually learn something from, from that. Okay, but so for the high level idea how a feasibility algorithm would look like is the following, you, yeah. Um, so the first statement is not algorithmic because uh, the answer is take any feasible X in W plus C, which you cannot. It is just existential. But that 
I mean, there is. Uh, I, I mean, it is usefully al algorithmic in some sense, as in we can sort of implement this if you give me a feasible solution, I can find the closest. Yes, one. sure. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I mean, yeah, okay. If, if I give you a feasible solution, then you can find the decomposition and can find the proximal vector indeed. So yeah, you don't need to find a proximal vector. So, right, maybe let me, let me say that, that again. So it is algorithmic in the sense that if you give me any feasible vector, then I can find a proximal feasible vector to D. But if you don't have any feasible vector, then there's nothing you can, you can do with it. Yeah. Okay, um, right. Um, and this theorem itself is quite useful already to give the high level idea how a feasibility algorithm would work for LP. Um, namely, initially, we have some vector D here that has positive and negative coordinates. Uh, we run our approximate solver that does something, it reduces negativity, it cannot set it to zero. Um, but at some point, we have such a small negativity that the proximity result, which is an orange here, gives you a guaranteed proximity. So you have some large coordinates, maybe this one and this one here, that you can't forget about because whatever you are doing essentially on the other coordinates will not influence them that much that they are in danger of going down to zero again. So that is the high level idea. You find this near feasible solution, you recurse in your algorithm on the small coordinates and whatever error that introduces on the large coordinates will still keep them positive. And if you do that, if you recurse on that n times, then you have your feasibility solver. If you are a bit more careful than that, you only need a recursion depth of m instead of n. In our setup, m is smaller than n, potentially exponentially much smaller. And then you can plug in the modern, essentially matrix multiplication time solvers for approximate LP, and you get such a runtime for, for exact LP, as in feasibility. Um, similar ideas carry over to optimization with the theorem for optimality that I've shown on the previous slide. Um, maybe let me just go quickly over that. Um, the idea is that you repeatedly run feasibility solvers now for the dual side. So you obtain your feasible S that is done negative, um, which you require for this result, which we require to be able to apply this result here. And if you, it's, it's getting technically complicated, but if you take care, then, uh, then you are able to not only reduce this negativity here, but also to reduce this value of D on the support on your dual side. But this comes at the cost of one feasibility on the dual, one feasibility solver on the dual. And you learn in that time then that, well, there is an optimal primal solution that, is not too far away from your current vector D. And by complementary slackness, that tells you that these variables that are so large can then be deleted in the sense that you know that they are positive in optimal solution. So they are zero in every optimal dual solution. And this gives you a recursion depth of N. So you run N feasibility solvers on the dual, which gives you N squared calls to an approximate solver. And again, if you take care, then you can reduce that to m times n, so you get the overall runtime of m n times LP solver. Okay. So much for proximity and black box approaches to um, to LP. Now on to interior point methods, which are essentially a yeah a very different approach and. Where I think that we would get in the future the best runtime improvements for exact LP in terms of the condition numbers. So what again are we doing here? This was explained explained like five times already in this workshop. In our case, we have a slightly different uh, tier point method because we alternate between predictor and corrector steps, and this is sort of necessary. So standard tier point methods, at least short step tier point methods that can use inverse maintenance have the following property that whenever you are close to the central path, you target a point that is something like one minus order one over root n away from your current point and move to that. And then you have the argument that only a few variables are changing. And this gives you the, I mean, with many more technical details, um, the improved um, um, amortized analysis. For us, this is not sufficient, this progress. 
because what we want is not a weekly polynomial time, um, kind of not, what, we don't want to go in weekly polynomial time down to the optimal solution, but in, in finite time, and that will require some dependence on our condition number. So the idea is what we do, you take the central path and kind of walk down the tangent until you go too far away, correct the error you made and repeat. Okay. Um, now we use the standard log barrier in our, in our algorithm and the central path equations can be written like that. So you have primal and dual feasible solutions. And for some parameter mu, you have that these X and S all multiply to mu at this point. So these points are unique and exist as long as the primal and dual have strictly interior points. And by complementary slackness, we know that our duality gap at every given point, or this already falls, but from weak duality is exactly the scalar product of our two central path points, X and S. Okay, so everybody of those multiplies to mu and this is exactly my duality gap. So given a certain element of the central path for some parameter mu, the duality gap is exactly n times mu. Okay. Now, what are the predictor steps that we are doing at every iteration? If you recall the central path equations, then the first derivative of these equations is exactly this system here. The first, and this is our, these, these are our update directions. So you want that your update in X lies in the kernel of your matrix. You want the update in S lies in the image of A transpose, which is the orthogonal space. And these are the equations that you have to fulfill to have the tangent to the central path. Okay. And um, as we've seen already, these are essentially given by projections, these solutions. And what are they actually solving? They're solving this system here, if you're exactly on the central path. So on the primal side, you have some x and what you just are trying to do is you try to find the minimum norm vector subject to your current local norm x and the same thing symmetrically on the dual side and this is exactly the fn scaling direction that that you have and this intuition is quite good to to show some combinatorial progress um, on the next few slides okay and now our iterate is obtained by walking some step length in this direction as long as we don't go too far away from the central path Okay. Now, because we solve L2 minimization prob problems on every step, we have the following problem for anterior point methods. Here, the red bars are my primal variables, the blue bars are not negative, they are just dual variables. And if I now run my weekly polynomial solver, then, well, it quickly makes progress. And at some point, you kind of can guess what your optimal solution should look like. So which, optim which variables should be zero on the primal and which should be dual, but you kind of never set them actually to zero because you solve L2 minimization problems. Now, here the rounding step for, if you allow to depend on the bit complexity, but just say, well, let me just set these guys here on the primal to zero. Let me just set these guys to zero, to, in the dual to zero, and then you're done. But if you're not allowed to depend on bit complexity, then this is not something that you can allow yourself to do. So you need to be a bit more principled in what you do. And the idea of Avasis and Ye is essentially to say, well, maybe I can't even set these guys to zero because they are not all zero. But what I can do is I can kind of prioritize those and just try to solve the L2 minimization problem on these variables while forgetting about these variables here. Okay, and this is what they, what they do. So you use the obvious partition that we just saw in B and N. We just call them B and N, the variables. And I just solved this L2 minimization problem that we saw on the previous slide just for one set of variables. And based on, on the solution you find here, you, you fix this down here and now solve it for the re remaining variables. And this is your, your step that you do in the Vavasas Y algorithm. And symmetrically, you can do the same thing on the dual side. There you start by only, by only solving the L2 minimization problem for the variables in B, and then go on and solve it for the variables in N. And if you are already, um, in terms of bit complexity, close to the optimal solution, then you, 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 determine, you, you, you terminate, you're done. But in general, this is not the case, and things can still get more, more complicated. 
And this approach that I just showed can be generalized to multiple layers. So we had a two layered approach right now, but you can also do it for, for many layers and you can have in practice more layers. So what would you do here in the primal side? If you look at these variables, you create a new layer whenever there's a big gap between consecutive variables and you solve first the L2 minimization problem for these variables here. Subject to that, you solve it here and you go all the way back to layer one on the primal side. On the dual side, you start off layer one solve the L2 minimization problem, subject to that on layer two and so on, uh, go up to layer five. Okay, now we kind of saw why this is intuitive, the right thing to do, but we don't didn't see why that should terminate in finite time, even, or in general have, have a good uh, runtime. Um, and here the, the main idea are, main ideas are two, why this makes sense and why, why it, um, yeah why it uh, converges in, in uh, relatively quickly. So one is in the analysis, what you need is you have on your central path, near monotonicity. That is you have some iterate mu and for the future iterates mu prime, you have the property that the variables cannot really increase only by a factor of N. And this is essentially clear by the fact that you reduce the duality gap all the time. So you can pick your local S as some sort of witness, and then you see that, well, if X at mu prime would be much bigger than, uh, than X, then the duality gap would increase, which of course is not the case. Um, so that tells you that kind of your optimal solution, X star, S star is kind of trapped below your current solution. Now for the other direction, you have to realize that whatever we are solving in an iteration is an L2 minimization problem. So if I now define this tilde X to be the update, if we were able to go the full step in the direction of delta X, then by definition, you would have that X tilde has a smaller two norm than X star in the reweighted norm at your local point. Okay, which in particular implies that there must be some variable where the optimal solution is at least as big as my new iterate X tilde. Okay, now I'm, I'm cheating a bit here because in the anterior point method, we are not able to go all the way to X tilde, but only a small bit. But this is not something you have to worry about. Um, this still works out. Uh, the more important bit is that I can apply this argumentation only once. So I can learn one variable I that is trapped, that's kind of bounded from below and above. And I can one, learn one dual variable for which the same holds. And if you go back to, to this slide here, then, okay, you learn that there is one variable here that is not moving anymore. There's one variable here that is not moving anymore, but you can't make any statements about whatever is happening here between the layers between two and four. Um, and this is where the layered step comes in. And the argument is now the following, because we essentially solve first the problem on layer five, the L2 minimization problem, you get the same argument, argument that there's one variable in layer five that the optimal solution lies above my next iterate. Okay, so that is how you can kind of um, repeat this argument, not just for the global set of variables, but layer wise, you get this property, one variable trapped on the primal side, one variable trapped on the dual side. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, this is what I just uh, what I just said. It's just the Lavoisier algorithm. Uh, let me quickly say that um, what the big picture is, why we had to improve on this framework, and that is uh, scaling invariance. Of course, we layered all our variables based on their values, but their values is not really intrinsically a property because you can just define an equivalent instance of ELP where you just take some diagonal rescaling of your matrix. So it's, it's not meaningful to layer variables based on their value. What you should do instead is have some scaling invariant layering. And that is what we introduce um, that improves the dependence on the condition number, which is also um, yeah, not invariant under rescalings. And um, we also put on top um, a better analysis of the full algor algorithm, which then um, gives us Okay, <laughs> which, which then gives us, um, let me just quickly jump to this slide, uh, which then gives us an overall uh, iteration complexity of, of n to the 2.5 times log of our condition number, many, many iterations. Um, 
Now, how do you deduce such a thing? Um, okay, let me let me go to go to go to this slide here, um, and that is essentially a, a crossover analysis between between two variables. Um, now, here I introduced the new layering. I, I did not say why this is scaling invariant, but you can believe me that it is. So this, if you forget about the kappa ij here, then this is exactly the layering that Vavasas and here used. But because we rescale it with these values, it becomes scaling invariant. Um, and now the idea is that if you have your layering at the moment, we have three layers here, and you have two variables i and j on the same layer, in that case, layer j1. Um, and you learn now, as we, as we saw on the previous slide, that there's one variable in the primal that is trapped. Let's say that is i that is not going to move anymore to the optimal solution. And you have one variable on the dual side, that is j, that is in the current solution that is uh, this um, yeah, rose, this thin red, um, compared to the optimal solution as star, it doesn't move either uh, that much anymore. And now in future iterations, so the first line here is the start, essentially the second line is some iteration uh, further down the central path. Now the current solution on I has reached its final value and the same thing holds for the dual variable j and now because you have that xi times si is always mu on the central path you know that this dual variable has to go down to zero essentially linearly with mu and the same thing holds with um, the primal variable right at j which therefore means that they will not appear on the same layer again in the near future so that is a crossover event because now j drops into a different layer and they will never again occur on the same layer. And this is some combinatorial progress between a pair of variables, which can only happen for every pair once, which gives you an n squared bound on the number of these events that can occur. And if you multiply that with the time it takes for such an event to occur, which I did not explain, but um, can be deduced um, kind of yeah, straightforward, then you get exactly um, this iteration bound that we yep uh, depicted down here and yeah i guess that's all i wanted to say thank you <laughs>